Hello, everyone. I'm not Estonian either. So a new challenge, I'm French, so nobody's perfect. Uh, and this is a new challenge for the translator. Um, fortunately, I have less vocabulary than you lose, so <laughs> it will be better. Um, so as Cantar Public, at Cantar Public, actually, we provide integrated consulting based on evidence and research. And then we are super close to the ground, super close to the citizen. And what we can see right now, this is that, of course, and as you may know, digital has transformed everything, all the ecosystem. Actually, it has impacted the relationship, the transaction, the interaction, and etc. And most of all, it has totally redistributed the power. And I think this is really important to uh, um, insist on this. This is about power. And citizens, they want the power. And this is part of what Bess uh, was saying. So they want the power. Uh, they have more power. And we need to take care uh, uh, about this. So how to connect or reconnect with the citizen. First, I will maybe take a step back and just give a set settling the scene with some um, trends, but I will go fast because you know that perfectly well, uh, and we talk about that. This is the digital transformation, the digital revolution is a, an always more uh, revolution. So this is more connectivity, and it, uh, um, it continues to uh, increase, of course, because this is more mobility, this is based on mobile. Don't go into the details, this is just uh, in orange the proportion of mobile on the total of connection, and as you may uh, see uh, on, the, on the left, this is uh, the middle and low country, and this is a uh, uh, level country, and this is super interesting because, and uh, interesting for us, uh, all of us, because they are leapfrogging when it comes to digital. So, and I will talk a bit about that later. And which means that, for example, the way the mobile phone is increasing in those countries, in the <coughs> low-income country, uh, is super, super impressive and go faster uh, than uh, the improvement of water, uh, of education, of lots of things like this. So, this is super, super impressive. Once the citizens are connected, once again, don't go into the details, this is just for you to, to, to see that once they are connected, they, have, they use uh, uh, digital in many, many ways. So this is about, of course, uh, discussion, social media, communication. This is about entertainment, this is about commerce, transaction, banking, and etc. But they have many, many, many usage of, uh, of digital. Of course, when it comes to media consumption, it has changed also a lot. And as you can see, there is kind of a migration, but this is not a replacement. And this is also important for us to know that this is an augmentation, and this is more opportunity to engage with the citizen, because we can use the classical means to do so, but also the, the digital one. More social media, I won't develop, but uh, uh, of course you know that. More financial transactions as well, and it continues to increase and increase. For us, this is also more complexity into society. So uh, at Cantar Public, we've developed kind of a segmentation. And as you can see, there are different groups of, of digital because we don't use digital uh, um, all in, in the same way. So we can have people, like functional people, you know, uh, not really engaged on social. Uh, a, a bit on digital, but who prefers traditional media? You cannot engage with them in the same way you will talk to the leaders or the super leaders that are super involved into social media. Just to give you an idea, randomly, for friends, uh, you can see that you have different groups, and one third for example, is functional, so the government in France cannot talk to those people the same way it will talk to the leaders, and won't use the ch same channel, won't use the same messages. And this is another example, just see the red line, because we talk a lot about millennials, you know, as it is a, a specific and, and uh, I, I, entity and etc. Actually, even among the millennials, you can see that they don't have the same usage of digital. So you cannot engage with them the same way. And millennials, you need to be more granular if you want to talk to those people. It's not enough to say millennials, it's too simple, too easy. More complexity then. 
and more divide, of course, so because even if uh, uh, the, the, the connection is increasing, of course, there are countries that still need uh, to be connected. There are people in two very connected countries that still need to be connected, so it creates also new challenges for governments. So where are we, actually? Here, yeah, I've crossed uh, two kind of numbers. Uh, actually, horizontally, you have the UN index, uh, digital index. So this is about the digitalization of government. And I put, uh, you know, vertically, uh, the level of digitalization of citizens. So that's pretty interesting because on the upper right, you have governments, you have countries where there is a high level of digitalization, both on the government side and on the citizen side. That said, there, are, there is still room for improvement, and this is a lot about functionality, uh, a, a lot about usage. So for governments, this will be about really leveraging digital, and, and I will develop a bit later. And this is also about inclusivity, because even if it's only 10% of the population uh, which is not connected, this is 10% of citizens. The brands, they don't care, but for governments, this is super important. You also have lots of governments that are a bit late compared to citizens. And here, on the left, upper left, this is really important for government to catch up with digital. And this is a lot about, of course, digital transformation for, for them. This is critical because actually the individual is both a consumer and a citizen. And consumers of those countries, they are pretty advanced and they are expecting the government provide the same kind of and the same level of uh, services, for example, uh, or communication than uh, the private sector. And then uh, you have a uh, uh, um, bottom left, uh, the countries that are still a bit late, both on the government side or the citizen side. By the way, uh, and um, um, you saw the numbers before, what's interesting, they will probably go directly to the upper right. Because for them, uh, this is, digital is probably the engine of the uh, development. And this is why this is also super, super important for them. And just to, to simplify uh, a bit what I want to share with you, um, I've chosen the three uh, most important pillars of action for, for government, uh, government. So first, the, co the public communication one, second, the public service delivery, and then policy making. So how could we reconnect or connect with the citizen, improve the engagement through uh, those three pillars? So the first one, this is about communication in general, knowing that communication and, and policy and politics now is super intricate. There is now a brand new ecosystem. Uh, of course, you know, even I would say five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, the institutions and governments were in control. But now citizens, they have more choices. They have more media, more means to express themselves. So this is much more the citizen who is in control. And to go back to your question, um, it's interesting because they are open to engage, most of them. Globally, you know, nearly um, eight out of 10 are open to, is open to engage. But actually only 40% really like engaging with institutions. So this is, this is super interesting because this is this gap we need to focus on. How to leverage this willing to engage um, when now our strategies, probably the way we do it, is not the right way for uh, the majority of citizens. Probably, and it's a, a first strike because there is a new curacy in the new e ecosystem which is around attention. Actually, it was pretty you know, easy. Uh, before it was about, you know, in terms of public communication, like for brands actually, this was about carpet bombing, you know, a big message provided by uh, TV or radio, classical uh, means of communication. But now, in, where in this ecosystem where the attention is uh, super splitted, uh, we need to change the way we communicate. This is also why we talk so much about citizen centricity. We need to enter by the citizen's interest. And then this is more the Trojan 
strategy when it comes to communication. So this is more communicate with than communicate to, which means first to find the right subject. You know, we are working with lots of institutions and they talk a lot about themselves. But first they need to talk about what is interesting for people. And there are always, you know, things in the middle. You can always find things that are interesting for citizens. So first this is about uh, the, the, the purpose the, and the value exchange because they will give you attention. They, have, they had no choice before, but now they have the choice. They could, okay, they could change and they could uh, switch you off and, and et cetera. So first, this is about the value exchange. Second thing, this is about interactivity. We talk about digital, we cannot forget that this is about interactivity. The third thing, this is about, I think this is about the way to behave. And this is about accuracy, but this is about sincerity. Most of this is about authenticity. It's simple, but actually it's not uh, always simple to, to do it. And of course, but this is about communication, this is about differentiation. So the implication, actually, this is what we say also in the private sector. This is when we want to talk, when we want to engage with the citizen, this is about, okay, engaging, talking to the people, but the right people and you see, this is complex and more and more complex. So, uh, you know, I'm used to saying that there is no more general public. We need to be more specific. Um, so the right people with the right channel at the right moment means that we need to know those people. We need to, to have a good understanding of our targets, their needs, uh, where they are, uh, the channel they use, um, and to, to have also better understanding of our reputation even before talking, before engaging, and adapt the tone and, and, the, and the content. Um, two examples, randomly, a French one. I'll stop after this one. Um, for example, by, you know, this is super simple, but by mapping social media, because as you saw, uh, this is the same digital, this is not a, a, a unique uh, behavior or usage, but social, uh, this is not uh, uh, the same either. So you can map conversation, for example, on social media, and this is super, super interesting. Then you can spot the communities and the sub-communities, and then you can address those communities, communities specifically. In that case, was people uh, who were talking about the French government. So it was easy to spot, you know, the journalists, the media, or the pros and cons, uh, uh, politicians and etc. But what was super interesting were the citizens, the bloggers. And then it was interesting to really, um, you know, go deeper into uh, the kind of uh, um, subject they were talking to, uh, the kind of tone they were using, the kind of cultural references, values, and etc. And then to address those people in the proper way, the uh, service d'information du gouvernement in France have chosen to develop a specific communication based on their codes, not the institutional codes, you know, because those people are not super interesting uh, into this. So new codes and new subjects. So you, as you can see, they've used, for example, the uh, illustration coming from Game of Thrones, uh, uh, from, uh, you know, superhero series and, and etc. And it was super, super effective. Another example, this was, um, and we will talk uh, maybe uh, later about this as well, but this was about uh, uh, road safety. And um, uh, as I told you, more and more, uh, you know, regulation, communication, taxation, etc. you can do so, but without engaging people, it's not effective anymore. And for road safety, uh, there is this example we worked on in the UK. Would be better with the sun, I think. Drink driving isn't something young men take Thank seriously. You. They've been told a thousand times by governments that drink driving can have fatal consequences. Young men don't listen. They just think it will never happen to them. But it does. Over 200 times a year. Peer pressure between friends is a major factor. But could we make that peer pressure the solution? 
Could we give them the tools to help friends stop drink driving? Could we show them how to ghost? Mates don't let mates drink drive, they ghost them. And using the right partners, we ghosted even further. And further. And for the thousands of shares and millions of views, maybe a mate or two from that 200 won't die drink driving. Think. So this, this was a pretty interesting, what we call the behavior change campaign, because this is no more about, you know, information or sensibilization. Most of the time, you know, pregnant women, they know that this is not good for them to, to smoke, for example. So what will help, really help them to uh, uh, quit smoking? So this is better understanding all the, uh, you know, rational system, but also the, uh, you know, the, your brain is separated between system one and system two. And the system one, this is about bad this is about you know automatism this is about cultural also reference and for those guys you know it was not enough to just threat them with the uh, uh, um, uh, all the car accidents and, and etc it was about playing on what really matter for them so their buddies and and then playing also on you more and, and etc and developing something around the channels that will be the more impactful into this uh, communication so, and now, um, when it comes to the public service uh, uh, delivery, actually there is a strong appetite for more online government services. As you can see um, here, citizens, they would prefer having access uh, to government services online even if there are still reluctant people. And it's interesting because the total is not uh, 100, as you've noticed probably. Uh, there are people that probably won't serve here and there. Uh, we still need to be convinced uh, about uh, public services. But actually, there is an appetite, and of course, because once again, they are also uh, consumers, so they use uh, um, internet and digital for, for their consumption and for Private services, uh, as you, it, it was told before, private, for example, the relationship with the bank is super strong uh, um, on digital, so of course, why not for the public services? And it could make their life easier. Of course, this is also for government a real opportunity. Uh, One point billion, uh, this is the exact number saved in 2015 in the UK based on the digitalization of public services. So it could be, 20 hospital, it could be free meals for uh, school children, uh, 1.7 billion, this is something uh, which, uh, which is a, a real, real, real opportunity for, for government. But there is a journey when it comes to public services. Actually, we worked on it uh, and uh, um, we, we've identified three stages. Uh, so the first stage is, is what we call departments.gov. So this is the first one. This is, you are present online, there are information online, but the services are still in silo. The second step, this is services.gov. Services.gov, this is more than only being present online, the service is working online. So there could be transaction as well. This is about information, but this, this is also about transaction. And then we, we, we begin to, to speak about, uh, you know, user experience at that stage. 
But the ultimate stage, this is the me.gov. And I've heard before, we've talked about personalization. And the me.gov, you are not only present online, giving information, making your transaction or your service working online, this is about relationship, having a strong relationship online, and this is really about experience. And this is all around the experience that you will make citizen live. And actually, this year, or la last year, sorry, uh, we wanted to better understand what makes a successful experience, and actually what drives an experience. So we, we've been you know, deeper into um, uh, several countries, and now uh, we, we uh, repeat this, which became a jack tool for public services. And there are five pillars, uh, actually, to drive a positive experience for the citizen. And once again, this is about being citizen-centric. The first one, this is citizen journey. This is to adapt your service to the journey. Once again, put yourself in the shoes of the citizen. So this is about simplicity, flexibility, saving time uh, uh, also. Of course, this is mobile. Uh, the president talked uh, a lot about mo mobile and, and mobility. And uh, of course, this is about uh, not only being adapted to the journey of the citizen, being adapted also to uh, its uh, uh, digital usages. Design. This is the mix between, uh, you know, illustration, content, but this is, uh, uh, you know, Victor Hugo was saying that uh, um, the form is the form that uh, comes to the surface. So design, this is not only, uh, uh, you know, being uh, nice, this is also uh, make the, the, the service work better because it's not only being attractive, but it's more effective for the citizen to um, use it. And this is about relevance, so to which extent the service is really tailored to the citizen and relationship, how does he feel when he used the service? And this is nearly an emotional component. How does he feel? What does it change to the relationship he has with the service, with the administration, and ultimately with public action? Because, uh, you know, Ultimately, this is what the public service are providing. They provide a service, but they also are building, you know, the trust in the public action. So this is super critical, of course, for each and every government. And by running, running uh, uh, dozens and dozens of those diagnostic tools, actually in many countries or for many services, it's uh, likely positive. But it's, uh, it's positive mainly in the functional elements. So in the citizen journey, mobile, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the mobile centricity and uh, being mobile uh, um, design and, and etc. I think it's, uh, it's more and more uh, the, the case. But when it comes to the relevance and the relationships, uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, the journey uh, is, still, uh, is still long. And this is this which will really create the last stage of the, uh, you know, the mid.gov stage and change and, and, and um, uh, will be probably most successful when it comes to be more efficient and to build the, the trust in, in public action. So of course, in terms of uh, implication, this is about understanding citizens' needs and their journey, identifying the touch points that will have the, the most impact as well, um, delivering a personal and, uh, and uh, integrated experience, being consistent, uh, being consistent is also critical. Uh, creative, and I think this is something we need to think about more and more. This is about the emotional experience with the users, and not only, by the way, with public services, but in, in general. Communicate with the public and co-create. We've talked a lot about this uh, before me. So, some examples. So, for example, the e-citizen concierge now, because uh, first it was a portal in Singapore, but it was a portal that uh, was aggregating lot of lots of links, and it didn't work. So they've reshuffled uh, the e-citizen portal to make it really, you know, a concierge. And there is a difference between the portal, which is an IT things, 
and the concierge, we, which is a real relationship with the citizen. And I think this is uh, the, the main things, and it was kind of a cultural change, because once again, this is not technology first, and I think this is the risk we all have. This is to be technology first, uh, because we have so many means, this is to use them, and to use them uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot, but actually, First, this is the experience, then comes the uh, technologies. And this was uh, the, the, this example of uh, Singapore. Another one, for example, um, was the way we contribute to um, uh, also put in place the high tax uh, in Kenya. So in Kenya, it was super painful to uh, um, uh, declare uh, your uh, revenue and, and etc. There were, were lots of queues uh, and it was uh, complicated. So by changing it, uh, into something digital, uh, it was more efficient. And then, I actually, it was not the, the biggest part of the work. The biggest part of the work wor was to convince people to use uh, this. And then, this is where comes the behavior change aspect, uh, lots of um, uh, time. The last example in Italy, which is a bit different, but is about the usage of digital, once again, not technology first, but for the real benefit of the, of the citizens. And in that case, you will see really, really, it's focused on the, the citizen need and uh, it's also really moving. There are 9.9 .9 million new cases of Alzheimer each year. When Alzheimer <coughs> hits you, nobody can help you remember your life. Nobody but you. Chat Yourself helps you remember by chatting to yourself. We created a chatbot which collects the entire life of Alzheimer's sufferers and gives back vital information 24 hours a day. And we've based it on Facebook, the life diary that everyone has in their pocket. Using push notifications, it helps even without any requests. Together with specialized psychologists, we trained it to answer every need, in real time and everywhere, giving sufferers the possibility to conquer fear of leaving the house. Ask without being ashamed. Take back the control of their daily routine. Chat Yourself restores independence to all sufferers and their families, especially during the initial stage of the disease. It can't stop Alzheimer, but it's a new way to live with it. Massimizza la qualità della vita. Per il momento sembrerebbe il massimo che c'è in questa patologia. Nice example, right? So, um, after communication and public services, um, about policy making, and I will probably go back a bit on what Beth was explaining before, because, um, and, and I think uh, we will also um, talk about another kind of power during the round table after lunch, but um, digital, what I want to insist on, this is, uh, power to the people. Of course, this is also power to the platforms and to other kind of actors that are also challenging for uh, governments. But it is power to the people and, and you know per maybe those uh, uh, headlines cover movies that talk about this because this is a fundamental change of gravity center for each and every society. Of course, digital is articulating uh, um, this revolution is articulating also to societal revolution, what we call individualism. Individualism, this is not individual, individualization, 
uh, which is not individualism actually, but which you know, with the progress of uh, education, of uh, uh, life expectation, and, and etc., create. Uh, something which uh, uh, reinforce the uh, expectation of, uh, of citizen and articulated to digital, of course, it's super powerful and it transforms our societies. And this is probably super important to understand because most of the institution, they stay stuck to the way society were built before. And they didn't move and they are not moving uh, faster enough to catch up with individuals um, and, to, uh, and to give them the power they want, the power they need. So we talk a lot about, uh, you know, being um, uh, top down and now being bottom up and etc. But this is often this is worse. And now there is a strong necessity to move to action. And I think digital and that's also the sense of uh, our discussion because in the area of politics, what we can see, I don't know if you are familiar with Hirschman, but Hirschman, uh, um, who uh, was an American academic, uh, told us that uh, in, a kind, in, in a situation of uh, unsatisfaction, actually there are three reactions uh, of uh, people. And it works for consumers as well as uh, citizens. The first one, this is of course, uh, you know, less and less loyalty, but this is also exit and voice. And exit, and we can see more and more abstention during election, we can see um, evaded taxes, we can see lots of kind of exit when it comes to citizen. But we also, uh, uh, see uh, more and more voice. So this is about uh, demonstration, this is about uh, strike. I know what I'm speaking about from France. Uh, this is about uh, populism as well. Uh, and uh, so exit and voice are increasing, loyalty decrease, partially because of this disconnection from institution to this new kind of society. And we can see that the poor management of this willing to be empowered, uh, this is uh, less and less trust in government. So this is something we measure through um, the um, uh, OECD uh, uh, study. Uh, and as you can see, more and more, the trust is becoming something critical. And nevertheless, this is a building block for, for us as government. So uh, if no trust, uh, then everything, once again, uh, will, will be a, a problem. So there, the implication. This is, of course, think capacitation. You probably know this notion from Amartya Sen. Uh, you want to uh, engage people, they don't want to. Actually, maybe this is you, the way you want them to engage, with, which is not right. Or maybe they don't feel they are capable of being engaged. I think this is a main problem prob uh, probably in, in, in Europe right now. Lots of people, they think they are not capable enough to do things and they are super frustrated because they want to, but you know, we spend uh, sometimes our time to say, okay, you cannot, you are not or they hear th this message. So first, this is about making people think they are capable. Consult them. So this is, uh, um, passive, but this is efficient, just to collect their opinion. And in a more active way, this is about co-create and evolve people in the decision making, and Beth talked about this before me. And then also something we forget often, this is consider and reward people. If they give, once again, this is about value exchange. If they give, then you need to uh, uh, reward them and to think about this reward. And sometimes this is just a thank you but you cannot imagine the number of time they participate, they do stuff without even a thank you from the institution. This is also that, the experience and the relationship. And then develop behavior change strategy. Behavior change, this is also this power before you, you, you inform, you persuade, you regulate, you tax. It was uh, enough. Now you really need, if you want to change the behavior, you really need to put in place very, and it's more difficult, but a very uh, um, uh, sophisticated strategy. So just as an example, this is what the EU, uh, and we are contributing to this, uh, uh, is trying to do to it, trying, and the challenge is big, to reconnect supranational leaders with European population through this uh, EU engaged program. This is also 
This is another example coming from the US. Um, by 2014, you will see in, uh, the state of Queensland had accrued a debt of almost $80 billion, an issue affecting the future of its 4.5 million residents. But research showed little public knowledge or interest in the debt issue. To address this, the Strong Choices campaign was put in place. It used an innovative mix of communication tools to directly engage many thousands of ordinary people like never before. Digital and grassroots programs, advertising and virtual town halls, a range of events, meetings and social media, all targeted and integrated. Through an online people's budget calculator, residents made their own choices to reduce debt and told the government their views. From this feedback, a detailed plan to reduce the debt was prepared. The people of Queensland wanted action. Strong choices had to be made. Another example. <clears throat> so, first, communicate with, not to. Second, imagine experience, thinking of the relationship, thinking of the citizen, putting you in the shoes of the, of the citizen, and then empower people. And maybe just to conclude, I think there is something basic, digital or not uh, uh, digital, or connected world or not connected world actually, but uh, which is a fundamental and probably uh, um, sometimes uh, we lose this. Uh, this is, as a conclusion, this is about the narrative. I think um, we lose ourselves into technologies, uh, um, uh, putting this technology first, this is important, this is a super powerful uh, uh, opportunity, means, levers, whatever, but actually first reaffirm your vocation and create the narrative. This is like the experience uh, and more than ever the narrative you will deliver to people is important because uh, <coughs> you probably know Kevin Kelly, he was the uh, uh, founder of the Wired, so super specialized to, uh, with uh, uh, digital things. And we know that, actually, um, we know that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult now that we've lost, uh, 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 you know, lots of uh, utopias uh, and etc. that even we are now a bit reluctant when it comes to technology, seeing Facebook, Cambridge Analytica and, and etc. So we are, as he said, we are future blind. And this is also our job in the public realm, your job as governments, to reinvent this future and to give stories to people and to give a narrative, to recall your vocation uh, of uh, general interest. So I think this is uh, probably uh, something basic and something that the citizens are expecting and that uh, is uh, fundamental for all the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Ganel. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. If we have one or two questions at the back there, sir, I'll run to you. Uh, thank you for very, very, very interesting uh, presentation. You. But uh, uh, I'm a lo one of the local people here. But I think my question is not uh, local. That's why I'm asking um, for uh, politicians: how to sell all this ideology to politicians in case when they have every two years elections, they would like to open something to cut something. Uh, to uh, show people they have done something. How did you explain how to sell the new ideology to our politicians, but they can also get maybe at least two vo votes more in elections? You, you, you mean, sorry, how to sell this to politicians? Yes. Okay. But uh, I don't know, but um, when you see, uh, for example, the level of trust, I think this is a first, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, way to uh, start convincing them, because uh, uh, when you see how it decreases in uh, uh, many, many space, space uh, countries area, when you see also, you, you can use one, once again. I'm coming from uh, this uh, background, so but you can use evidence. You know, this is about trust. This is about uh, there are more and more, for example, uh, not only demonstration, but also riots against corruption, 
which is another uh, subject, but which is also about uh, sharing the power, uh, because there are different kind of uh, of, uh, of corruption. So get back to the trends and and the numbers, uh, for for example. And I, I'm pretty sure there are evidences you can share with uh, with them, because and see the situation, for example, uh, uh, in Europe. See what's happening to uh, uh, Italy right now. Uh, there are concrete examples also that if they don't change, you know, this uh, question of populism, I strongly believe in Europe, part of it, not only, of course, but part of it is because we don't give to people the power they want. And I think uh, uh, now we have backlash everywhere and it starts to explode. So I think uh, uh, you can thread them, but you can also use, you know, um, more positive messages, you know, like the one uh, of the UK. If you want to transform the uh, public services, you could also have uh, uh, lots of improve uh, the use of, uh, of the public money, mm, um, improve the way you, you will uh, manage with your budget and etc. And um, so I think this is managing be between threats and benefits actually, because there are benefits as well. When the people are super committed, they can deliver a lot also and contribute a lot to public action and to your reputation. I don't know if it's uh, no, a right, should question. Move on, we've got one final question, and I, I, I think, we're just looking for hands, uh, and I, I think maybe something our president said could we touch on there, that you've got to make it easy for uh, people to use services. Maybe we need to pick some simple services that politicians can implement in two years. Maybe that's good for the citizen and good for the politicians. Anything else before we head out? Over there, sir, one more. Thank you, John Sharma from EMA. Uh, one of the things I think you missed out, and the previous speaker missed out as well, is managing public expectations. Because one of the big things is it's okay to uh, uh, involve the public, but if they feel that they can talk and talk and talk, and they get no results out of it. I know it's in the UK like that. People just say, why bother? It's a pretty screen, it's pretty. But at the end of the day, I'm wasting my time. Nobody's listening. Hmm. That has an impact back into e-government, of course, because hmm. they then feel that, well, it's all going down a black hole anyway. You know, we don't know where it's going to go into the trash bin. And uh, I think that's one area to really... Um, that we need to focus on more. The second point, uh, following on to the previous questioner, was I think whilst you answered him with we're talking about very soft uh, uh, signs of success, I think there has to be some very hard KPIs for the politicians to say, yes, this is actually one, I'm pleased I did this. Uh, it might be something as simple as a, a survey saying, uh, to the citizens, are you happy with your EID or e-government services? And if they all say more, more than 50% or more, or it changes, mm -hmm. then fair enough. But there has to be some KPIs for a hard-nosed uh, minister with budget controls and budget stresses to say, right, this was worth doing again next month. Yeah, I, I totally agree on, on KPI. And by the way, if we have, uh, um, you know, if we, um, the power is different. So the way to, 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 to um, uh, manage with this is different. And probably we need to invent and reinvent also the KPI of public action. Uh, so I think this is part of the work we are trying to do. Uh, but this is also very challenging, I agree. Very challenging also your first point. I think uh, managing the uh, public expectation is super hard. And it's super hard also after years and years uh, uh, during which, uh, you know, We've, uh, <laughs> we've, pretend, we've pretended to give them the voice, uh, uh, but not effectively. You know, uh, this was the uh, story of Beth around the Obama's consultation. And then what? So I think uh, in the meantime, the expectations are now higher and higher. But that said, when we really share the power, we also share the responsibility. And I think by sharing the responsibility, I think it also managed the expectation uh, by, by, its, by itself. You know, sharing uh, uh, more information on um, 
budget or how they they want to manage uh, with this but concretely uh, you know this is not about information and then they are passive in that case the frustration will get higher and higher so i think and it's not easy and probably and to go back to the kpi point this is first uh, you know uh, i often use this expression, this is think big, start small, and move fast. And this is the same uh, uh, you know, for the, the public action. And you, get, you can have quick wins and proof for citizens. And then it's, um, it helps to continue to replicate, to amplify what you are doing. And also, it helps to measure, actually, because uh, uh, this is a scale uh, to which you, you can measure. Quick wins, yeah, quick wins, I think. Um, Quick wins. Thank you. I have to leave it there. Thank you very much. Please, one more round of applause for Ganelgu. Thank you.